And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining us for the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss best practices, in, or excuse me, we'll discuss data architect versus data engineer versus data modeler, and sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Rick from Couchbase for a word from our sponsor. Rick, hello and welcome. Oh, you're muted. Rick, you are muted when you're ready. Donna, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? I can hear you, yes. But all we right. cannot hear Rick. Yes, okay. Rick, you got a mute button in the bottom middle when you're ready. We can see your slides. If you want to put it in presentation mode. You are Sharon. Okay, I'm gonna unmute you, Rick. Are Thank you, you very much. Thanks a lot. Can go. you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, now we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling to find that um, unmute button. Sorry about that. Uh, no right. worries. There so, you go. <laughs> I'm Rick Jacobs, and again, thanks for taking the time to meet with us today. I'm gonna run through a few slides really quickly um, and then pass it over to um, Donna. All right, so first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the data modeler, data architect, and data engineer personas, and how Couchbase can facilitate those people and help, help them do their job in a more effective manner. Um, quick disclaimer, I took the definitions that I'm using today from a article on dataversity.net. That article was entitled data architect, data architect versus Data Modeler versus Data Engineer and it was written by Amber Lee Dennis. So a data modeler is basically a, a user that translates business rules into usable, conceptual, logical, and physical models and does some database design. Data modelers can, tend to be interested in obviously data access. They want to have flexible schemers and they want to be able to design models um, easily. So Couchbase enables data modelers by allowing access to data in S3 from within Couchbase via a functionality we call remote links. That means that you can have data outside of Couchbase in a repository like S3, connect to that data, and then query it as if it were within the Couchbase cluster. We also support ingestion from multiple data sources, whether that be streaming sources like Kafka, um, via a Kafka connector, and also IoT devices using Couchbase Mobile. And modelers can query Couchbase using a SQL-like syntax. So there's no need to learn a new proprietary language to query your data within your Couchbase cluster. What's a data engineer? Data engineers specialize in big data solutions. So they generally work with data lakes, data platforms, and data warehouses in the cloud, and they tend to be data-centric and very cloud-oriented. How Couchbase enables them, um, we provide them with tools that they need to access data quickly and easily, and then we have an intuitive database UI. And then we also allow data engineers to model those tools using BI tools by our variety of connectors that we have to the most popular BI tools. Data architect. Um, as you can probably tell, these positions overlap. So these data-centric positions, personas overlap. Um, an architect is basically a generalist. 
So they have similar concerns to the other data personas, but at a more comprehensive level. Architects want systems that are highly scalable, they want maximum performance, and they want to be, into, be able to integrate data from disparate sources while also minimizing costs. So to summarize quickly, um, Coachbase is a top performing NoSQL database because of our memory first architecture. And we provide tools to easily ingest and query data within your Coachbase clusters. We have support for all the major S uh, languages via various SDKs. We have ODBC and JDBC drivers to allow you to connect the data within Couchbase. And we have a UI that's very intuitive. And we allow you just to, to query that data within our clusters using SQL syntax. And we also provide all of this functionality in the cloud. Um, our cloud offering is a native, is a cloud native DBAS offering. Um, and it gives customers the scalability of the cloud while also allowing them to keep data within their VPC, which is very important. Uh, your data remains within your VPC, within your control. We manage that data, but you never relinquish control of your data. All right, uh, thank you very much for your time. And now I'll pass it back over to our host. Rick, thank you so much. And if you have questions for Rick or about Couchbase, um, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A section. He'll be joining us at the end of the presentation here today in the Q&A portion of the, of the webinar. Now let me introduce to you the series speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert um, with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their or enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get her webinar presentation started. Donna, hello and welcome. Hello, thanks Shannon, and thanks for everybody uh, for joining this session. Um, and thanks for uh, Rick for a good introduction from Couchbase. Um, so, as many of you know, and it was good to see some familiar names in the in the attendee list, as always, uh, this is a monthly series. Um, and the, one of the most popular questions that Shannon is pretty can, uh, you know good at answering is, will this be recorded? And will we get the recording and the slides? Yes, you will get both. Um, so the good news about that, if any of these previous topics look interesting to you, anything about data quality or master data management, these are all on, on, on recording um, and available on the Dataversity website for, I think, for eternity. <laughs> so um, today we'll be talking about uh, data architect and data engineer and, and data modeler and what those terms mean. Um, and then next month we'll be talking about graph database before we begin another lineup next year. So hopefully you can join that as well. But today's topic, without further ado, um, is on that tricky topic of, it shouldn't be tricky, but it is, uh, for a for an industry whose one of their main goals is, is semantics and getting common meaning, we're really bad <laughs> at that. Um, of what, what do we mean by a data architect and a data engineer and a data modeler? And I think if anyone knows me, you'll know I'm not shy and I'll probably even disagree a bit with Rick's definitions. And that's not uncommon. Um, again, we all, th th it is unclear. There's definitely some overlap. I would agree with that. But there is confusion and there is ambiguity. Um, but they're super important roles. As the organization becomes more data centric, um, we do need to get some consensus in the industry and there's a lot of confusion out there. So hopefully I don't add to the confusion and I can help with it or at least get some good discussion. I know um, you folks are not generally shy either and there's always a really great robust chat going on as well. So please do continue with that tradition. This one is always interesting. We often do in the series sort of a career-based one or a roles-based one. Um, more than any other this year, I had very proactive um, engagement from people reaching out to me even ahead of the webinar. Oh, I'm going to miss it, or I'd like to join it. Can I get the, can I get the recording? Yes, you can. Um, I'd like to cover this. I have a lot of interest. And, and there were sort of two big buckets of people who were interested. Probably, obviously, those looking for work, um, you know, anyone who's catching the recording in the future, this was sort of recorded uh, in mid-COVID times, which is a difficult time for, you know, anyone right now, um, kind of in the career trajectory. Not so much for data, there's still a lot of opportunity out there, but that, that said, it's a very unusual time. 
So if you're one of those looking for work, how do I position my skills? How do I find that right role that fits my strengths? And, and what's that right opportunity for me to really grow? This should help you a little bit, maybe give some ideas, but I've also had several people reach out to me who are hiring right now, who are, are building their team right now, or who are CBO, or a hiring director in HR, and they're looking for these roles, and, and there's a lot of confusion of what type of person I get. And unfortunately, I also work with a, well, fortunately and unfortunately, um, I, I do a lot of consulting, as Shannon mentioned, um, and either we help people with this confusion and say, you know, if you were to hire, this is what an engineer does versus what an architect does. Unfortunately, there isn't always a good fit because there is confusion. And I've seen some really awkward first starts that end up kind of going separate ways at companies because there was a misunderstood uh, expectation. So I think hopefully we in the industry can get a little clarity. Hopefully when either you're a hiring manager or you're one of those looking for work, um, maybe this will help you kind of get that clarity for what you're looking for so we don't end up in a role that isn't a good fit because that doesn't help anybody. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, um, there is always a healthy chat in this conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm sure on this call there are people in both categories. So as I say, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll maybe connect some of these people that are both hiring and looking for work. That's not the purpose of this webinar, but you never know. You know promises, right? Um, so hopefully both of these audiences can get something from this presentation. It is COVID times. It is unprecedented in terms of, you know, difficulty. That said, data is continually to be hot. Um, you know, it, we can always use things like buzzwords. Um, uh, like data digital transformation, I mean, we're going through it. It isn't a buzzword. 100% of my clients um, had to basically overnight switch from being in person to being digital. And that's not a theoretical thing. It's not a buzzword. It's how they do their business. And a lot of the folks that we had been working with did that very smoothly because they've had great data. The other great thing, and I will talk a lot about this in the presentation, if you are the type of person who wants to have that seat at the table and a data-driven business, again, you could say that's a buzzword, but it's real. So many companies, why the people on the previous slide are looking for help is data is hot, data is strategic, the data-driven business is generally do, ahead of, uh, do better ahead of their competition. So organizations, and why we get a lot of business is uh, organizations are looking for someone to help navigate that. I might be the CEO of a retail company. I am super smart. I am very interested in growing my business. I know data is hot, and that's where it ends, right? Uh, it, it's sort of like me. I may want to do a, an addition on my house. I generally sort of know what a house looks like and what I want. I, I would be the first person you would not want to do to, to build your house and put up the foundation and put the electrical in and the plumbing and all of that sort of thing. I would be lost, right? Or my car. I, I know how to drive it. I know the basics if I need to change the oil and then that's about it, right? So I, if, if it breaks on the side of the road, I want to bring it to an expert. And I'd love to have that expert explain things to me, not in a condescending way, but in a way that really makes it clear. And that is where I think a lot of C-level people or anyone in the business is really looking for that kind of data translator of this is what data means, this is how you can use it for opportunity, and that's why I think it's an exciting time to be in business, uh, data and be in business, and if you're that type of person that likes to wear two hats, you're in a great place, and there's a lot of people looking for that role. So, yes, data is hot, and unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, which maybe is not a bad idea in today's world, um, you've probably heard this famous Harvard Business Review article about, you know, the data sciences being the sexiest job of the 21st century. I mean, we'll give Harvard a little bit of, you know, credit. Everybody has data quality issues. I think they had a typo there because it's really the data architect, which is the sexiest job of the 21st century. I am not biased at all. Um, and I'm sure several of you on the call will agree. Um, so I say that a bit tongue in cheek, um, but not really, because I think one of the reasons a data scientist is a popular role, I'm not belittling data scientists, um, but often that elusive or, or yeah, what do they call it, the unicorn type role that can be a great data scientist can understand analytics, can understand statistics, um, and then can translate at that into business opportunity. They're hard to find um, and, and, and that is why, because it's very rare, and it's a great breed of person that can be great at both, be a great communicator, and also be a great statistician and, and analytics person. Similarly with an architect, right? So we'll talk a lot more about that. I think a great architect, and we'll, com we'll compare that to engineers and modelers and all of that, sort of also with a data modeler, 
you can speak the language of the business. You can speak technology as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. Uh, you can also speak technology as well, and that's really where a great data architect can shine. And, and often data architects have a great sort of um, that advisory role in an organization. Um, an analogy I'd like to give, if, if you're familiar with Janice, uh, the god of the, the New Year January was sort of named after Janice, a little trivia fact. Um, Janice has two heads, one looking into the past year and one sort of looking into the, the future year. And that's how I sort of see a data architect, is that a really good data architect can be talking to the business. In fact, I, I consider myself one this morning, I was talking to a company and of all things, we were talking about the difference between um, don't laugh, lard and butter, and how that would be marketed differently in different markets. Switch to another call, we were talking about early childhood education, switch to a different call, we were talking about construction company data, right? So I find that really fun, because I think I am a sort of that Janus type of person that loves to understand the business. I really want to understand the business rules, you know, despite it being five in the morning, because it was a European client, I was sort of interested in what the difference between lard and butter was. And anyone who's a data model or data architect is probably subtyping that right now in their head. Um, is that a dairy product? Is there some type of that, right? And um, that, that can be a very popular trait, right? Then you should be able to also turn to the, the technical team and say, wow, should we model that in a graph database? Should that be a relational structure? Should we do a dimensional schema so we can slice and dice it? Should we put that in the cloud? What would be the security implications, right? That is a really fun job, but that's also a hard job. Um, and that, I think, is the difference between a data architect and some of the other roles we'll talk about. Not that it's better or worse, but it's more broad. And it is more broad, so you're not necessarily going to be a specialist in any of those platforms of how you can spin it up in the cloud and get the right performance in the cloud. Maybe, I mean, if you are absolutely a unicorn, they can be perfect and everything. Um, but generally, I do see that data architect um, as someone that can successfully speak the business, translate that business into technology. And there's a lot of organizations who really want that um, in an organization. So uh, seeing a couple other roles being put up in the chat, um, Perfect way into what is in a name. Uh, and anyone who gets my nerd joke with the rose up there gets extra credit. Uh, but there's a lot of data centric roles. We'll talk specifically about three data architect, engineer, modeler. There's some being put up in the chat. Um, again, that cobbler's uh, children have no shoes. We are really bad at consistency and naming standards in a, in a, 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 a discipline that does naming standards and data standards. So, um, Here's just a few. I kind of looked through my network on, on LinkedIn and said, you know, what are some of the, the titles I've even seen? And you'll see that was just a big, it took me about six minutes. Um, and that was just the beginning. So wide range from database administrator, data platform, Mr. Cloud data platform, data, and then some cutesy ones, you know, data guru, data whisperer. That's okay. Uh, and everyone has a preference. You can differentiate that way. Personally, were I a CEO, I'm not sure I would want to hire someone with a cutesy guru title or maybe, um, you know, if I'm going to hire an accountant, I generally probably wouldn't go and say, I'm going to go find my, I don't know, money whisperer. Maybe, I don't know. That's, that's just my preference. Um, but I do think kind of as a, as a profession, um, we may want to start to be a little clearer and standardizing on these definitions. Um, Rick started in the beginning uh, by looking at things like data diversity. Great. Um, I think things like the DEMA, Data Management, um, data <laughs> Management Association, and their Data Management Body of Knowledge, DMBOC, is also a great start. We are getting better. But it is confusing. So if you are one of those people in the beginning who's a hiring manager and says, I am really confused of what I need to build this platform or what I'm trying to do with my new data center initiative, you're not alone. And there is a lot of people that call themselves an architect that's probably the, I, I sort of you know, showed my hand on what I consider an architect. We'll go more into that. Um, that's, I think, often where is the biggest confusion. Are you a builder? Are you an architect? Are you an engineer? Um, think of just in the English language, and we'll, we'll go more into that. Those are very different meanings. But I, I think in, in data land, because data is sort of virtual and nebulous, we, we get very creative. Um, and I have seen some bad hires um, where it's just not a fit. Neither hirer nor employee was a bad person. There was just a misunderstanding of what that person does because of that title. So hopefully we can get more commonality or we can at least 
when we're hiring to say, I'm an architect, I'm the type of architect that draws architecture diagrams, right, um, versus a platform engineer type thing. So using analogies, because we do a lot of that in data, um, the term architecture is not, you know, uh, limited just to data. Uh, in fact, we often think of architecture in terms of building houses, and we use this analogy all the time in data management, partly because it is so concrete. We can kind of picture, we've all seen a house being built. We've all seen probably these architecture diagrams. I think that's very clear, though. When I am talking about a, a building architect, it's pretty clear. I expect someone to come up with kind of that roll of paper in their hands or, you know, nowadays kind of a CAD diagram or uh, they're drawing pictures. And, and those pictures I can understand, even that one you're looking at, you'll see the one on the left probably has a bathroom and a, some windows in it, right? You kind of get a high level. We generally don't confuse that one with a person on the right that's getting their hands dirty and pouring, you know, concrete um, or, you know, put it, putting in the infrastructure um, because it's so visceral generally not a very difficult understanding, but we do kind of mix those things, I think, um, in data land. So to kind of keep going with that analogy, again, I, I think there's a, a clearer, like obviously there's overlap, clearer distinction in this building houses or building infrastructure between an architect, an engineer, or a builder, right? So if I'm an architect, again, comes in in a suit, not a, not a weird thing. He's got those, you know, famous architecture role diagrams in his, in his hands. You know, he knows enough about the structure, obviously, because he couldn't build something that fell down. Um, but he generally works with the owner. He draws the diagrams. He understands the requirements. Are we building a, I don't know, a, a nuclear power plant? Are we building a vacation home in the Hamptons? Very, very different kind of architecture requirements. And he would work with the owner to really understand that. The engineer... They're going to be on site, um, you know, probably in the heart. Well, they're all wearing hard hats because they're safety first. But um, he's probably going to be on site. Is that is that building that the architect engineered structurally sound? Um, are the materials equipped to hold up the, the right uh, weight for this particular piece of equipment? Things like that. More of an engineer in terms of that more classic sense. The builder, again, you probably don't mix him or her up with the architect. You know, it's a sturdy type that I live with. I'm swinging a hammer. Um, I'm actually there in the field building things with my hands. Um, and those distinctions, again, are, are generally, there's overlap, I get it, um, but in general, it's a little more clear when you're actually building something like an infrastructure or a house, right? Um, so unfortunately, when we get into the virtual world in which we live, you know, we could stereotype, but it's a little hard when someone just walks in. Uh, you don't have a hard hat on versus, you know, a suit and or, you know, architecture diagrams or, you know, a hammer or being an electrical engineer and all your equipment. Uh, the distinctions aren't as obvious. We can sort of get away with a lot more. So the first architect uh, actually used, the, if you probably noticed the subtlety, um, has the same definition as the building architecture. I work with the owner to understand their needs and diagrams and, and to match the requirements. And just like if I were the owner of the house, the engineer, could, uh, the, oh, see, I just did it. The architect could show me that and I kind of get, okay, there's five rooms in that house. A, a, a data architect should be able to show the business a data architecture diagram and they should be able to understand, okay, that's how you're classifying dairy products or my customers or my products or my whatever, right? And it should be a business facing type deliverable. Um, again, when you're now engineering, just like you want to make sure the platform of your building is structurally sound is not going to fall down um, and is performing in the way you want it to be. A data engineer is in that same category. I'm actually building the platform. I want to make sure it's structurally sound. I want to make sure it's performant, and I want to make sure it meets the requirements. When you're building, you're sort of building these applications. So maybe I'm coding, maybe I'm generating database script, um, but you're actually doing the, the building itself. You're probably not, you might be using the diagrams, but you're not necessarily creating them. You're more kind of a coder um, or a, a builder. So to kind of use something, again, a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. Um, <clears throat> architecture versus construction when we're talking about data. So jumping back to this picture, pretty clear when you're building a house what the difference between is architecture and construction, hard to mess up a piece of paper and cement, right? Um, <clears throat> but in data land, it can be a little more vague. So on the left, probably a logical data model. That's something I would think a architect would build. This is the architecture that needs to build the business requirements. I can understand the big picture, but I'm building enough to be able to build something with. 
One example, I know there's many, um, a building might be something like database design DDL or something on the right, right? I'm actually going to be building the tables that meet those requirements. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a retail company. I want to be able to link buying patterns of my customers. The architect would find the right pattern to, to design that, put it in some sort of architecture diagram, and then pass it over to the builder that can sort of build things as well, right? So that's one view of uh, an architecture, right? To go somewhere in the chat says, is that a data model? Well, that's one of the topics we'll talk about. I think architecture is a little broader than just database design. So this doesn't just span, especially in today's day and age, you're not just talking with a relational database anymore. How does that whole solution architecture fit? How do these components and platforms fit together in a design? Um, and that's an architecture. So do I need stre real-time streaming, streaming data? Do I need a traditional data warehouse? Do I need a data lake? Do I put it in the cloud? How do these fit together? How do I understand security and privacy? And the result of that is generally a diagram, and that's a very important solution design or overall architecture design that then feeds into the database design and database build and all of that. But somebody needs to see how those pictures fit together. For some reason, I don't know why, um, there is in some camps a bit of disdain for that. Well, that's not architecture, that's just pictures. Well, that's kind of what an architecture is, right? If you were to architect a house um, and you hired an architecture to help you design an addition and the, the person showed up with a hammer, you'd think that was a little strange. They're like, I'm not, I'm not ready to build it yet. I, I, I kind of want to sit down with you at the kitchen table and design how many windows we wanted. Oh yeah, whatever, we're just gonna start putting windows in and see what happened. Like, <laughs> you probably think that was very strange, but we can get away with that in database land. So sometimes that does happen. Oh, I'm architecting. No, you're building. Um, and, and be really clear of architecture is design. It's stepping back, it's putting things on paper or CAD or you know data modeling tools or enterprise architecture tools and, and designing before building. Um, this is kind of a fundamental principle. Um, so can you sort of do both. Is there an all-in-one? Well, yes, and it depends on a lot of things, size and scope and, and complexity. And, and this is a similar analogy in, in building houses, right? There are certain design and build contractors, either in, in massive um, you know, construction sites, there's some that do both design and build, or, you know, I did do a, an addition on my house and I found a contractor that was pretty good. And he, he sort of did a high level design and he wasn't an architect, but he was able to sit in the kitchen with me and kind of design things on paper. It wasn't as fancy as if I had hired the fancy architect, um, but it got the job done. And, and for small projects, that might be the same person. You, you might be wearing a lot of these hats in a small company um, in the data industry, but, but just like for um, a construction project. You know, if I'm building a, a massive nuclear power plant, I would be really surprised if the same person who designed on paper that power plant was the same one putting in the turbines and, you know, setting up the electrical, right? There, there's fit for purpose tasks, um, same as with the data world. So it is a continuum, you know, Rick mentioned that as well in the beginning, um, and that's where some of the confusion, and so I thought maybe kind of drawing out that continuum might help a little bit. Um, and there is a spectrum and there's overlap and all of that. So I kind of stepped back from just those three particular roles we talked to and just kind of said, were I to start a successful data program or an initiative, or I'm that CEO or chief data officer that wants to have that data-driven company. So what would I need? Well, to start on the left, I'm kind of starting with, you know, the, the business centric on the left, going to more of the kind of the platform on the right. So business to tech. So if I'm fully business person, um, I'm going to be setting that data-centric vision. What does my company want to do? Do I want to be an online company and sell products online? Do I want to be brick and mortar? Do I want to be a fintech? Do I want to be a traditional insurance vendor? Whatever, that, that's the role of the CEO, right? And so well, as we go into, I, I started in the beginning, this idea of the, data, the business-centric data person. Yes, and maybe the, the chief data officer is that. At some point, though, you don't own the business. Like, it's not your decision of whether this is going to be a fintech company. That, that is the CEO. So we also have to tread lightly. We might have ideas, but it's not our responsibility. And that's where I think some of the distinctions, where is the actual accountability? So the accountability for P&L and, and business model design, that's really probably going to be with your CEO. You might have CDOs and strategists. But, you know, I, I've been doing that a lot in my business. Of, yeah, you might have an idea, but unless it's your responsibility, you don't really have the final say. 
So the CEO, it, it, his or her responsibility is the, the profit and loss of the business. And if this doesn't work, they're held accountable. So you can have an idea. Wouldn't it be great if we sold data from our customers online? Well, they might nix that, right? So um, as we go kind of down the chain or up and down, or however you want to say it, um, as we go into more of the business requirements, there's a lot of different roles that can contribute to that. This might be this elusive data architect that I do see as a broad role that can do business and tech. Um, and just like someone who built your house kind of needs to understand what kind of house it's going to be. Some people are more of a pure business analyst role. All I do is, not that I'm belittling that, but the, the, the limitation of that is I'm only looking at the business requirements. I'm not trying to architect it or design it. I'm just, and that is a whole practice of just really getting those business requirements. An enterprise architect, I think we did one earlier this year, or was it last year, I'm losing my mind, of, of enterprise architect versus data architect. There's some overlap there too. Something like a conceptual data model or a business process model, capability models. We do a lot of those in our practice. How can you truly understand your data until you understand the business capabilities that that data is supporting or the process that that data is supporting? That's kind of a design thinking type of thing. That's really where your conceptual data model may live at a really high level. Are we understanding the business requirements, right? So that's the business requirements and kind of that overlap with data. As we kind of go down to the data vision and landscape, that's really where that data architect, maybe solution architect, there's a lot of different words there, but that's really where you're, you're that picture I showed of the um, kind of this more one on the left. What's the overall integration architecture of all the different systems and platforms from data lake to data warehouse to data quality and all of that looking big picture around the data you might be doing architecture di system architecture diagrams data flow diagrams maybe you're looking into these new technologies whether they're a fit in your organization pretty cool role if you ask me because uh, you really get to do a bit of both looking at the business but also looking at the tech but at some point like you can design a house all day long at some point you want it built that's really where you're getting into executing this data landscape. To me, that's where this age and then data engineer sort of starts. We're starting to engineer and build it. Um, again, that could be you're, you're configuring the platform, you're integrating the data, you're making sure it's performant. A lot of roles there too could be ETL, it could be data integrator, it could be a lot of different, depending on the scope of that. At some point within all right, let's just jump, I'm jumping around a little bit. Within this architecture, maybe there is a, you'll see here's tiny master data or data warehouse or operational data. All of those need to be architected in their own way. Um, there is an architecture within each one of those boxes of how you architect the data. I am seeing more and more, and it's making me nervous in this industry, that people are missing that. Like I could begin old lady rant here. When the word data warehouse is so incorrectly used. What do we mean? There's a data platform. Yes, there's data on a thing, but is it is it a dimensional model? Are we trying to slice and dice data? Is it an operational data store? How that data is organized needs to be fit for purpose. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but that's when you're architecting and designing, you need to understand that. It's not enough to say, oh, it's in Azure on the cloud or it's an Oracle. But what, what is it? How, how are you organizing that? That's where I see this. I'm calling it the database design or the data store vision because it's not only a database. It could be a graph or it could be a key value pair, right? But someone needs to design that. That, I think, is more of your data modeler or your data architect also. Maybe a data engineer in the sense that um, it's this type of person that you're wearing several hats. I, you know, I know in as a small database, I can kind of build it, design it, and build it. Um, it's sort of an addition on a house and not a nuclear power plant, right? I do kind of wear both hats. Um, that could be the data models. It could be, you know, s selecting what type of data store. Again, is it a relational database? Is it a graph? Is it a key value pair, et cetera, et cetera. It could be the glossary. Um, it could be your semantic layer in your BI tool or whatever, but that's really, you're designing the data. Um, I'll talk a little bit about different paths to data. I mean, you might have, you, the type of person I think that might be really good at that might have been an English major or maybe a logic major or because you're, re, or when you're getting into semantics, right? Um, it's really at a kind of a, I don't want to say theoretical because it's very practical, but really getting to the core concepts and logic behind how we store this data and the right kind of person really loves that stuff. 
which is a very different kind of person than wants to get the platform up and running and being performant. Again, some people like all, but in terms of buckets. Um, at some point when you've designed that database, you need to execute and build that, just that database. So I'm going to create a database or whatever data store. I want to make sure it's performant and build it. That might be your data engineer. It might be a DBA, right? Um, and then that has to sit on some sort of infrastructure. So maybe it's in the cloud. Maybe you're getting your own server and hardware. Um, and that's sometimes an infrastructure team. Maybe it's a whole different team. Um, who's doing the backup and recovery? Like where's the hardware or cloudware that it's sitting on? So that's a broad spectrum. I probably some slight differences in there. I mean, we could argue all day, you know, of, of world titles. But in general, there's someone from the very high business level, and at some point, this business strategy of I want to be a data-driven company that sells books online has to sit somewhere on a piece of hardware and make it work, right? And there's a lot of different teams across the organization that have to get that little disk on the server spinning and into doing the right thing. Um, and that it can be complex. So if you are the business person or the hiring manager on this call trying to figure that out, you're not a dumb person. There's a lot of confusion there and a lot of complexity. Um, so again, to, to, uh, to, uh, to do what was on the tin or whatever of this, what was promised, I do want to go back to the three roles we talked about, which is data architect, uh, data modeler, and data engineer. And so how I see a data architect is yes, if there's some overlap with sort of a data modeler, that person should be able to design a database, um, understand their normal form versus dimensional star schema, uh, you know, what a graph database is, that kind of thing. Also, though, look at that broader solution architecture of, of how do those platforms fit together, being able to do a system architecture diagram and be able to speak to the business and understand these higher level conceptual data models and how that fits with the business. So you'll see there's a little overlap here with the business vision. Again, not always, but if you are that type of person that wants to have the seat at the table or you are kind of working with the CDO to, to really do business strategy, that's great. And, and that is an opportunity and a lot of business people are looking for that. You don't own that though. And that's kind of where I show overlap, but not ultimately P&L responsibility. Unless it's your company and it's a startup and you're truly doing everything, um, but generally, and sometimes I, I have noticed more times in the business, we need to be a little careful. They may bristle, like, you're not telling me how to run my business, are you? Like, no, 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 I'm understanding your business, and I'm suggesting we might have a really cool technology to help you. It's very different from going to the CEO going, saying, you know, you got to move everything online. Maybe you're right, but tread carefully, because that's really not your role. You're, you're enabling, not necessarily owning. Um, so that's the data architect, which is broad. I think that's why it's a that's why it's the sexiest job of the 21st century. I'm gonna go talk to Harvard Business Review about that typo. Um, so when we go into data modeler, um, I do think that is a little more narrow. I'm a huge fan of data modeling. If I didn't show my cards there, I think it's really valuable. Um, generally, yes, there is a database design or data store design of that um, aspect. And it could also extend to things like glossary. And I, I kind of looking at the chat half-heartedly because I don't multitask well. There's some comments about data management and sort of, yes, there's some overlap there. Things like a glossary may not truly be a data model or task, but there is some overlap. And sometimes that overlap isn't here with things like a conceptual data model. I think a true data modeler could go up to that level from conceptual down to logical, a little bit of physical. Um, and then that physical kind of lives with more of that data engineer or DBA uh, level, right? Um, and so data engineer, um, again, could be broad. So I think typically it's more down to the infrastructure, right? But you should, again, you, you could be the type that really needs to understand that whole landscape. What platforms are we building? How do they fit together? Is it on the cloud? Is it a big data store? Is it a warehouse? Again, depending on the size and scope, you could sort of get into that design land a little bit. Uh, again, back to this type of role that can design the house and build the house at the same time. You might be that kind of person. Um, and so you might be designing some of the data models as well. You probably are more, though, on this execution of building the data. I'm, I'm the builder, right? I'm the person with a hammer in my hand and, or the saw or the you know, electrical wiring. I'm actually doing the work. So that kind of build work. So building the database, performance and tuning. And you may, again, depending on the organization, sometimes there's a whole infrastructure team that sets that up. Sometimes you're setting up the servers, you're doing the cloud platform, you're doing backup recovery, you're doing everything. So again, that's kind of the spectrum and hopefully where some of those land. So um, 
some of you, many of you, um, especially if I, it's folks that may have reached out even ahead of the call, may be looking for a job or maybe looking to switch. A lot of folks kind of ask me, how do I get in? And some of the comments, how do I even get into data architecture? Unfortunately, this isn't the beginning of an old lady rant, but there isn't, there's a lot of education around data science or even programming. Data management and it's changing. There are, are programs around data management, but it's not as common for someone to an undergrad say, hey, I'm going to do a, a degree in data architecture or data modeling, right? It's a kind of a subset of something else. And then you get into the business world and you're like, wow, people need this. And you skill up and you get there. So um, because a lot of people just in the past few months have asked me this question, it, it seems I don't know, strange talking about myself, um, but people ask. So I thought I would just go my journey um, of how I got into data management and how I kind of evolved in different areas. And for those of you who are looking um, or looking to kind of switch into one of those roles I described that isn't um, what you're currently doing or you're just new or you're trying to get into data management, a lot of people in data management, oh, there was one data diversity um, conference, I think people asked where to start, and it was like 30% who are music majors, right? Not what you'd think when I went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston and decided, oh, I'm going to be a database administrator. A friend of mine did just that. He was a jazz musician, and now he's a database administrator, right? Because you could think, again, that logic, similar brain patterns, um, maybe not the most direct route, but he got here. Some people who I know do finance, and they're so sick of the data being wrong, <laughs> they go and they fix it with data management. Um, I've had people in chemistry kind of, you know, there's a lot of different roles that can get you to data management. Uh, so I mentioned librarian. Yes, uh, they kind of think alike. So... Um, I'll just go my path, and probably not your, it won't be your path, but maybe it'll just give you some ideas. So way back in the day, before the beginning of time, um, I was an economics major. Um, so I guess I could say I was the sexiest job of the, it was the 20th century back then. Um, uh, that's kind of, I did a lot of econometrics, and that's data science in a way, right? I mean, not too far. I was also an English major, and it's a bizarre combination for some. Uh, I went to liberal arts school, um, and any of you who did, people love to bash that major. I've almost come full circle. So I, uh, on that topic of, is it better to start with a broader liberal arts or go straight into engineering? Um, and when you're in liberal arts, they sort of tell you, oh, it'll, it'll pay off eventually. You learn how to think and you learn how to communicate. And then they, I was sort of always snarky when they asked me for money. I said, well, I could send you a sonnet poem, um, but I'm not making much right now. And that was sort of true, I guess, compared to my colleagues that maybe graduated with a pure accounting degree or something. You didn't get there quite as fast, but now I've almost said I would rather hire in some ways a liberal arts major because you learn that critical thinking. I was the kind of school I went to, it was, you know, it was sort of for fun. It's sort of saying, you know, tell me why a telephone and a polar bear, um, which is better and why, you know, you just and discuss, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that does help. So during college, um, to sort of pay my way, I did a lot of bizarro jobs from I don't know, I, I did some manufacturing, I worked in a finance company, I, and, you know, looking back, some of those were the most valuable lessons, because as I do consulting now, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to understand the business, right? Because I would consider myself one of these data architect types, where first thing you do is understand the business. Well, you know, I've actually worked in a shipping company and packing the boxes, so when I talk about, you know, pick and ship and all of that, know what you're talking about. So if you are one of the younger people on the call and you're doing a job that right now you feel is kind of weird, I know this sounds like exactly what your mom and dad tell you and, and gosh, and I rolled my eyes too. It can really help. Um, you know, working in a fast food chain, you, some of our customers are fast food chains. And the more you can understand that and keep your eyes open, it um, can really be helpful. So, but after I graduated, I went back to DC and I was an economics nerd um, and worked at a think tank doing kind of economic models. Again, I guess that was data science um, uh, for a think tank for the government. Um, I though discovered, were I to continue, uh, that's kind of a PhD track it, to really grow in that, and that was a lot of school. Um, I kind of discovered we were also building data models and uh, software applications to do that. And I said, this computer stuff is kind of neat. So I went back to computer science and kind of switched tracks. Really, 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 really happy I did. Um, I did my stint in programming. Um, I found quickly, though, I love programming. What I missed and didn't realize I was doing in this think tank was sort of data architect, business analyst, consultant. We'd work with 
folks in the Pentagon and the White House and things like that. It was back in the day. It was kind of cool what I was doing. Um, didn't realize it because you're 20. <laughs> you're like, oh, doesn't everybody do this? Um, but really getting the requirements and then building systems to implement that. Um, so I realized that for me, that my kind of spectrum on that spectrum was I would rather work with the business and then do the programming side rather than only sit in the queue. I had an aunt who was a programmer when it first came out um, and she was the lovely person. She said, I do not want to work with people. I want to get there early in the morning before people come, get my job done, and I just want to do the math. Fine, that's also a valid, but you're probably more on the data engineer side unless I'm either the architect. Right. So I, I did. That's where I moved to consulting. Uh, I, for me, that was kind of a perfect fit for me. I loved working with the customers, also working with the data. Um, got the enviable position to kind of help start up a community of um, excellence, I guess they called it, over in Europe, uh, living in Italy and, and really kind of building their practice there, which was really great to kind of see the different cultures and really understand a global view. Uh, came back to the U.S. and then went more into product management, which, again, this is a kind of an odd, but actually building some of the tools I was using. Um, so, and I'm doing it now. There was actually a feature I had put in and a tool I'm, I'm actually using now to client. Um, one I was really happy about and one I was kicking myself. So it was kind of neat to actually build some of these products, data modeling tools and data, uh, metadata tools and things like that, and really get that aspect from the vendor side, um, which is a really different uh, aspect. Um, for some of you on the call, you might have think I joined the dark side, and then I went to product marketing, um, and really sort of, you know, how do you market and, and sell those products? In some ways, that was really valuable. How, how do you spin something? How do you take something and then communicate it really well, which did help my consulting. Um, so now I, I realize, though, my heart is in actually doing the stuff. I like building it. I like building But when I was building it, maybe I was a good product manager because I could always go back to how are we going to use this? How is a business going to actually implement it? And to me, that's my, fun, that's my sweet spot, looking at a company, really understanding how it ticks, and then building some cool stuff. Um, I did a stint in um, a more of a management consulting company that, again, on that spectrum, um, was truly up here. We were doing business model design, very little data, but it was super valuable. How do you model a business and really understand where it goes? Which then was my aha moment of not many people are putting both of those together, business design and data design, and how can we kind of a data-centric company. So that's where I started. I am the founder of Global Data Strategy, and that's what we try to do here um, is kind of, I don't want to make that a sales pitch, but we try to link that uh, business with the tech. What's next? Who knows, right? I might just give up and, and be a ski instructor, um, but I don't ski well enough. But who knows? I guess for those of you who are starting, that, that kind of age old, just try things because you're never going to know, um, isn't such a bad idea because mine was very varied, but I did see some patterns as I was looking through. I like kind of working with the business and I like the tech. I wasn't really happy in only marketing because it wasn't techy enough. I wasn't really happy in only tech because it wasn't people enough. Um, so you might be any of those on the spectrum, but so don't hesitate to kind of jump around. Um, and and there, especially in data management, partly because there's you know there there isn't as much of a set rules around things. You can do things like jump from finance or marketing or music to data as long as you do get those skills. So as you search, if you're one of those who's searching, some just think, look for your strengths. And I feel like I'm being luxury now because that's my dad used to always say to me, and I'd roll my eyes. Uh, still do. He said it just the other day. <laughs> and I'm old and he's old and I still roll my eyes. Um, but think about that. As you may, Some of you may have more time. Um, um, do, are you a big picture thinker? Do you like, the, do, do you, uh, like learning tech? Really, where do you, are you a good communicator? Do you hate, or, or any of these gaps? So what are your strengths? But then expand your knowledge because you kind of have to be a purple person <laughs> of that idea of being a little bit of both. Is there tech you haven't thought of? Are you so in the relational land you don't look at a uh, graph, right? Are there technical things you could expand? I do a lot of hiring and I have to say, I, I love a good communicator, but if they don't know Azure and I'm looking for Azure, they're out, right? So you can't just, you know, there's a lot of good, the, the guy who packs my groceries is a really nice person, but I wouldn't hire him, right? So it's not enough to be a good communicator. You do have to have that tech. I do not want to belittle that at all, right? And expand your network, obviously, right? People are very open now, I think more than ever, um, because people are sort of locked away and, and looking to um, connect. 
uh, LinkedIn is, is my friend. <laughs> I'm there a lot. Uh, the Data Management Professionals Association, that is a global group of data people like you. And, and the people we've introduced to that often say, oh, I found my people. I didn't know it existed. Uh, look online. There's uh, all over the globe. There's groups that um, meet in person when we can, and a lot of them are doing virtual things. So you can attend a lot. And of course, data diversity and things like this. So um, I do want to open up for questions because we generally do, but just, just to summarize, great opportunity. It's a tough economy, but there is still almost more so opportunities for data because people are going digital. You do need a broad range of skills. Um, no matter what end of the spectrum, you, you need a bit of everything. If you're a business person and don't know tech, you're not going to last very long. And if you're an only tech coder that absolutely won't speak to people, you're not going to do well as well. But there's a spectrum in between. Um, and just be clear, though, what you want to do, what you're interested in, and what you actually want to do. Um, and have fun with it. It's a great time to be looking at this stuff. Just a couple of things before we close. Um, uh, we do this for a living, so if you're looking for help, let us know. Uh, and I hope this isn't too bad. Um, <laughs> but we are hiring. So if any of those jobs are of interest to you and you are looking to extend your career, check out our webpage. Um, next month is on graph. And now I will open it up to quick Q&A. So Shannon, over to you. Are you on mute? Shannon? Thank you, Donna. Yep, sorry, help helped by unmute. Thank you for this great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and the recording. So diving in here, and Rick, we jo uh, jo uh, Rick, you welcome you to join as well in answering these questions. You know, this question came in even before we got started um, and says, I believe uh, if we were to put in order, we should see data architect for the overall data collection steps, info gathering data modeler to do the design, logical and physical, and data engineer to put the design in place and perform ingestion integration. Thoughts on that? And, um, pretty oh, well yeah, I, think that, I think that's fair. Um, I, I think the only different, yeah, I would think an architect could be very broad and, and sometimes where there is a distinction is, you know, that platform architecture, not just the sort of database architecture, but I think that's a fair summary with kind of the nuance we added to the call. I don't know, Rick, did, did you feel any differently on that? No, I agree. That's definitely a fair um, characterization of the different elements. Yeah. So should a data architect be uh, realistic, pessimistic, or optimistic? Um, should they be biased in any way and force their opinions? Oh gosh, those are two different questions. I'll ask the first, and I do have I have my own bias on that one, and I've touched on it in other presentations a lot um, of that idea of the optimist, pessimist, or I think I've got a slide I show where there's sort of the just a totally stereotype kind of the grumpy DBA um, who tends to be just you know always sort of looking at the problems um, and being very negative. And of the business person on the other spectrum who tends to be more the optimist, we're going to double sales this year. If you've ever, one of my best um, experiences that I never want to do again is going to sales kickoffs um, when I was in the vendor side. And it is totally a rah rah fest. Of, <coughs> How much are we going to sell? We're going to double it. And then you've got the DBA and the other who sort of paid to find pro. Well, that's never going to work. Right? And, and that's often where there's a disconnect because the business is psyched about the stuff and we tend to be the ones that are grumpy telling them it's not going to work. So I would say an architect or that business-centric person, you have to be a realist. You don't want to be ridiculous if it's not going to work. But try to put on your, your positive hat um, because I, I think you're going to get more – we tend to just have that stereotype of being the more negative hat. So I would say realist to optimist, given that some of us tend to be on the realist to pessimist side, <laughs> given that, again, we're trying to fix stuff, it could probably um, be a benefit. And then there was a second part of that question, Sharon, that I forgot already. Was there a second uh, part? Is it to be biased in any way and force their opinion? Um, I don't think you should force your opinion. I, I, again, well, it depends. If you own that decision, you can force it. And that, that was sort of why I stressed that is that ultimately the business is that if it's a business suggestion, it's the business's decision, right? And that's where the, we, I work for one company. We sort of had it was funny on I told you so board. So at some point, you know, or it could go in both ways. I could have a business and I, I think, you guys, you should go and sell this data set and they never do. You can always say I told you so, but that wasn't your scope. Similarly, you could tell the infrastructure team we need to go to the cloud, and they didn't. 
I told you so. You know, the data model, if you're an architect, that's yours. You can own that. And for the other ones, you only have influence. And I, I would say sometimes all of us, human nature, we tend to step on people's toes. So just be clear when it's a suggestion and when you own it, right? Rick, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I, I actually came from a sales background as well. So I do remember, you know, the sales rah-rah meetings um, <laughs> and the like. Um, so I agree. Um, an architect needs to be realistic, not necessarily pessimistic like the grumpy DBA example, but <laughs> not like the sales guys, you know, having shots after sales kickoff <laughs> because, you know, that's not necessarily realistic. So, again, the point is for the DBA to have some grasp of reality and use that in making decisions. Yeah. Yeah, don't do shots before you set up the server. <laughs> <laughs> is it, so is it easy for a data engineer to become a data scientist and vice versa? Oh, uh, I, those seem opposite to me. So I would think the engineer is the type of person who wants to get their hands, well, again, I don't stereotype, uh, get their hands dirty and kind of build stuff. I, I often a data scientist comes in and I would think they want to do the, the kind of the exploration. And I want to find all these cool patterns in the data and do all my, you know, uh, models and things like that, my analytical models. And often those people don't last because they come in and the data isn't prepared enough to do that. So that's why data architects and engineers can be really popular because they can serve out the data for the, uh, the scientists um, to do their, their magic. And if you're a hiring manager, think of that too. Is your data ready for a data scientist? Because that can be disappointing on both sides. I've heard a lot of data scientists go, I, did not, I was not hired to be a data cleanser or a data organizer. I, I need to analyze the data, not munge it around. Um, so the fact that their hands-on is similar, but I think those are kind of separate and you don't want to mix them up because they may not be, maybe a data engineer might want to kind of take statistics and do modeling but I, uh, to get there, but I don't see them as similar myself. But I don't know, Rick, thoughts on that? No, nah, I don't think they're similar. Um, I think data engineers just spend a whole lot more time, you know, wrangling data than mm -hmm. just do. But having said that, some data scientists I have worked with in the past ended up doing a whole lot of data engineering too. But mm -hmm. I would have to say that's probably somewhat of a waste of the data scientist's time. There's probably more effective ways to use a data scientist than doing a data engineer's job. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, so we're going to move on to the programmers uh, controlling the show, we have seen project managers as good programmers. So when data personnel have more to say to have more say to business, then um, can we see more PM from uh, DS domain? Oh, what was the last part of that question? So when data personnel have more to say to business, um, can then can uh, we see more uh, PM? Uh, project managers from uh, DS domain? Um, I hope so. I, I, yeah, there is this, I don't know why it happened. Um, I guess we all have our theories, but there tends to be several camps in the industry. There's programmers and there's data people. I never saw that distinction because when I was a programmer, I, was a, I just saw the data, but maybe that's why I'm in data now. Um, but they tend to be different camps. The programmers want to code stuff and they don't, where they see, data is kind of a second order thing, whereas data, people see the data as a first order thing. I think data people often have a better ear to the business because data is the business, right? They understand that you're talking about my customers and my products and things like that. Um, so you can use that to your advantage. Um, and I wouldn't, has, I, I do see though more recently people are starting to get, maybe because I'm self-selecting my projects that tend to be data centric, but even in agile development, you, you can have um, a data model at the beginning of every, every sprint um, you could say, is, is there a, you can even do your data models in sprints, or you could say at the beginning of every, every sprint, if you're adding a data element, does it compare to the data model? And if not, what's the impact, right? You can still d integrate data into programming techniques. And I, I do think that's an area that those silos need to come down because it doesn't make any sense to program stuff if the data isn't right. So it's kind of the core of things. Yeah, I would ask that the NoSQL environment, it's a, uh, a little bit easier to do your, to create your data warehouse and then do your schemas on read. So in that situation, um, programmers actually have quite a bit of control over how the schema looks because they're assigning the schema when they read the data. 
I love it. Well, thank you both so much for this. Uh, that is all the time we have for today. Um, thanks to our attendees who are so engaged in everything we do. It's been a very hot topic. I will uh, get some of these questions over to you, Donna. It's, it's been great. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring today and making everything, all these webinars happen. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.